Hello, my name is Karen Pascal. I'm the executive director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry to audiences around the world. We invite you to share the daily meditations in these podcasts with your friends and family. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to interview Dr. Ken Shigematsu. Ken is the senior pastor of 10th Church in Vancouver. It's one of the biggest and most diverse city-centered churches in Canada. Ken's also the author of a couple of award-winning bestsellers, God in My Everything and Survival Guide for the Soul, How to Flourish Spiritually in a World that Pressures Us to Achieve. He is also the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal Award to Canadians who are recognized for their outstanding contribution to this country. That's quite an honor. I first heard Ken speak here in Toronto at a conference at Whitcliffe College. It was evident as I listened that the writings of Henry Nouwen had been a source of wisdom and inspiration for him. Ken, before we dive in to discuss your book on the Survival Guide for the Soul, I think our audience would love to know a little bit about your background and your heritage. Tell us where you came from and how you ended up in Vancouver. Sure. So I'm originally from uh, Tokyo. And uh, when I was about two years old, our family moved to England. Uh, My dad uh, got a job as a broadcaster for the BBC and ended up in Canada as a family when I was about eight years old. So, um, yeah, originally from Japan. Uh, but moved when I was a fairly young child. And then uh, as a younger man in my 20s, I returned to Japan and I was uh, working in uh, the corporate world for the Sony Corporation. So you obviously retained both languages then. Yeah, uh, I consider myself primarily North American. And uh, I, I speak some Japanese, but if I'm getting into a more technical discussion around theology or philosophy or current affairs, um, I, I'm somewhat lost uh, because I don't know all the technical terms in in Japanese, but uh, in terms of basic communication, I'm okay. So what took you, in a sense, you went in a very different route. You ended up uh, going to the the, uh, opportunity of being a pastor. How did did that happen? Yeah, well, um, this may sound a little bit uh, strange, but uh, when I was about 20 years old and uh, still a university student, I happened to visit uh, this church in Vancouver called uh, 10th Avenue Alliance, and uh, it was on a Palm Sunday. And at the end of the service, I had no uh, intention at that point of being a pastor. Uh, the, the voice came to me very clearly and distinctly saying, uh, you're going to one day return as the pastor of this church. Oh, so my I just goodness. thought it was just so weird that I, I dismissed it. Uh, and then uh, I ended up... Um, going to Tokyo to, to work for the Sony Corporation, and then um, I felt that God might be calling me into uh, uh, some kind of vocational Christian ministry, so I ended up uh, leaving Tokyo, heading to Boston for a few years to go to uh, seminary to study theology, and then um, when I was in my late 20s, I was back in the Vancouver area and was um, seeking to discern how God might be leading me, whether I was to go back to the corporate world or to pursue some kind of vocational Christian ministry. And I spent about a week fasting and praying. And on day three of the fast, I know this is going to sound strange as well, this doesn't happen to me very often, but the words 10th Avenue Alliance Church came clearly to mind. And on day five of the fast, the word senior pastor came clearly to mind, and I ended up visiting the church. I discovered that they had a pastor, so I thought I must have heard wrong, and it it seemed to me that most of the people in the church were older, uh, white Anglo-Saxon, you know, senior citizens, and I felt I was just too young, uh, too, um, you know, not white enough (laughs) to be the pastor (laughs) of the church, and uh, the pastor confided in me afterwards. I didn't tell him about this sense I had that I might be called to serve as the pastor, but I I said that I was just open to uh, some kind of vocational ministry. He told me that because there were no kids, his kids' ages, he was going to leave and encourage me to put my name uh, in the hat. And and so I did. And uh, after I was officially called, then I revealed to the search committee and the board that I had the sense of being led here in this time of uh, fasting and praying that I had uh, experienced months earlier. 
What a wonderful story. I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. I bet you needed it. I bet there were times you went, what am I doing here? And you needed to remember that you were really called to it. Did that ever happen? Or were you always like, oh, this is a perfect fit? Oh, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, uh, I, I really needed that. So the church had cycled through 20 pastors, Karen, in, in, in 20 years, uh, included some associates, and had gone from over 1,000 people in its heyday back in the 50s to 100 and something just prior to my coming. And uh, I think it was the first week or second week on the job, the church secretary walked into my office and she said, Ken, if the ship sinks now, everyone will blame you because you were the last uh, captain at the helm. I think she was motivating me to work harder. And uh, I, I had gone through a difficult um, breakup with uh, a woman that I was engaged to be married to. Uh, so that was very uh, personally painful. And um, I wasn't feeling at my best. And uh, there were times in those early months and years where I felt the church would be so much better off with another pastor. <laughs> and, and yet I sensed um, even in my vulnerability, that God had called me. And uh, Henry Nouwen's uh, writings had uh, been a big encouragement to me uh, in that time and uh, and beyond that time. So, uh, yeah, th- that, that sense of being called initially certainly acted as a, an anchor for my soul. How wonderful. Oh, my goodness, I love that. I just love it. I, and I know it's a very flourishing church today and a very diverse church today. Is You know, rightly so, because Vancouver is one of the most diverse communities, I think, in the world, and, and it should be reflected in, in its churches. But that that's pretty exciting. You've written a couple of wonderful books, and I thought today we would take a look at The Survival Guide for the Soul. And I love the little subtitle to it, How to Flourish in a World that pressures us to succeed. I, I think that's incredible. It's, a, it's beautiful. Congratulations on that. Thank you. It says pressures us to achieve. I, I changed the title for you, but I think achieve is the one that you, you chose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, like probably a lot of your friends, Karen, that are, are on this um, podcast, um, would say, I believe in God. Uh, I believe God loves me. And yet we continue to measure our actual worth by what we do, by you know how well we did in school, if we're a student or not long uh, graduated, um, how, you know, how successful we are at work or how our family is coming along. And I felt, uh, you know, in part inspired by the writings of Henry Nouwen, that if a person, if I or if others could really believe at our deepest level that we are loved by God, that that would fundamentally change the way we move through the world. You know, I um, am pretty driven and ambitious by nature, uh, but I would have to admit that a large part of that has been uh, motivated by a desire a need to somehow prove my value, justify my existence in the world. And I have found that as I have slowly awakened to a sense that, that God loves me, you know, no matter what, um, that it, I, I still want to contribute something to the world. I, I, I want to, in fact, offer my best, but it doesn't come out of this anxious, desperate need uh, to prove that I'm enough, but out of a deep sense of gratitude that I'm already accepted and cherished by the one who matters most. It's interesting because I, I I think, I sensed that as I read the book. I sensed the fact that you, like Henry, and Henry was a driven person too, that need to achieve, that need to, to be the best you could be. It sounded to me as I read the book, you could be a, a perfect workaholic. But <laughs> ending up finding that other thing, and it, and really in a sense it's the counterpoint, isn't it, to, to, to that need to... Uh, prove our worth to others is to receive our worth from God. It's such an amazing thing that God offers. One of the things that strikes me as I, as, as I read the book was it's an honest struggle. It's an ongoing struggle for you. That's one of the things that I kind of found myself hearing. And at the same time, I think, you know, you've written this book knowing that there are certain tools you can bring into your life that will help you live it this way, which will help you survive that, that that pressure, that tension 
just to achieve. Um, I, I was intrigued by one thing that you wrote. You wrote about, and it kind of gets us off into the book, you wrote about the two atoms. Why don't you just describe, what do you mean by the two atoms? Who are the two atoms that we meet in the Bible, and how are they kind of us? Yeah, thanks for asking, Karen. So the two atoms that uh, Karen is, is referring to from the book, uh, Survival Guide for the Soul, are the two atoms that we see in the book of Genesis and the opening chapters of the Bible. And I'm, I'm getting these ideas from a, a Jewish uh, rabbi and, and theologian named Joseph Soltovichik, who wrote uh, about 50-something years ago. And as he was reading through uh, the first pages of Scripture, he noticed that Genesis chapter 1 seems to have a certain portrayal of Adam as being this uh, person who is called to fill the earth and subdue it. So he's driven, he's ambitious today. Uh, this driven Adam uh, would want to start businesses, would want to find uh, very effective vaccines for COVID and other <laughs> illnesses, <laughs> wants to control the world. Uh, and we need that um, that driven Adam, and I call that ambitious Adam, striving Adam in the book. But then as we go to um, you know, Genesis 2 and 3 and 4, we see that Adam is called into a garden to humbly serve it, uh, that uh, he yearns for connection with his creator as he walks with God in the cool of the day. He's lonely until Eve appears. And so while we have this ambitious side, we also have this soulful side that longs for connection with God, with other people, with creation itself. And I call this other part of us soulful Adam striving Adam and, and, and soulful Adam. But in our culture, whether it's Japan or uh, North America, uh, much of the world, all the focus, the, the spotlight is on striving Adam. And so if we are workaholics, uh, we'll tend to get noticed. Um, if we never keep a Sabbath, we will probably get promoted. Um, whereas we're not going to be affirmed, by and large, if we cultivate our soul, our connection with God, and the most important people in our life. And so I felt that message uh, was needed, certainly for me, and perhaps for some others as well. Oh, I, I found it to, I found it very life-giving. I, I, I'm grateful for this book in my hands right now. You write at the beginning, this is kind of an introduction to the book, you say, this letter to myself is a survival guide of sorts. It's a guide to surviving the damaging effects of a driven life, a way of overcoming the need to succeed by living satisfied in the acceptance and love of God. It's a survival guide for the soul. And and it's interesting because those two atoms, they exist in all of us. They're, they're conflicting mm -hmm. in all of us. And you're right, even probably more so today. I thought it was fascinating to read at one point that, you know, today when when people when young people write down what they want more than anything, 50% of them want to be famous. They're just mm -hmm. driven with this sense of um, that I won't have succeeded in life unless I'm famous. But this book um, has an honesty to it. You know, I don't... It's not simple. It's not easy. It reminds me of, it does remind me of Henry. It does remind me a great deal because Henry could identify things, but living them was sometimes really, really, really difficult to do. Um, how is it that you are finding, how do you go about taking this truth that you're beloved and that you don't have to prove it? How do you, how do you really get it into the, your being and, and keep it there and live out of it? Yeah, and I think this is where um, some simple um, and yet at times challenging spiritual practices can make a big difference. So um, the the Jesuit uh, Anthony de Mello from India uh, uh, tells a, a story maybe you're familiar with, Karen, of um, of a little fish that's uh, swimming down a river and comes into the ocean and approaches a big fish and says, excuse me, Mr. Big Fish, um, I'm looking for the ocean. Can you tell me where it is? And uh, the big fish says, you're in it. It's all around you. And the little fish looks disappointed and says, no, uh, I I'm just in water and, and swims away. <laughs> and uh, no matter how people feel right now who are listening in on this uh, conversation, who are participating right now, um, you know, God is near. God is closer than our breath. And yet often... Our eyes aren't open to the reality of God, and so um, spiritual practices can help awaken us to a sense of the God who is always with us, the God who always um, looks at us with love. 
it, it's just vital to take what you're saying and, and kind of bring it into our lives. Tell me a bit about these spiritual practices. Tell me what you use and tell, tell us, kind of give us a sense, a taste for it. Yeah, so um, you know, right now, a spiritual practice uh, really feels like a lifeline to me. So, you know, we're uh, still in this pandemic that has lasted longer than any of us anticipated. And, uh, you know, some mornings, if I'm honest, I can wake up feeling a little melancholy, a twinge of the feeling of depression. I, I feel the weight of folks who have uh, lost their jobs mm-hmm. in this time uh, in our community, uh, as, uh, the people uh, I know who have contracted COVID, and in one case, uh, a mother of uh, three adolescent girls uh, was on a ventilator fighting for her life. Thank God she uh, pulled through. And so I, I felt the weight of this season. And, and so uh, some mornings I wake up feeling a heaviness. Uh, but what I do first thing in the morning is I'll uh, leash up our uh, golden retriever, Sasha, who's uh, eight years old, but still has the vitality of a puppy. <laughs> and uh, we'll go for a run. Uh, through our neighborhood toward a a little park uh, not far from our home. And as I'm running, I will recount uh, gifts over the past 24 hours. They may be simple gifts like a a delicious meal with um, our family the night before, uh, a meaningful conversation with someone, uh, the the good weather that we happen to be enjoying in Vancouver, which is it often rains here. So when the sun comes up, we're (laughs) we're very thankful. So I begin the day uh, or the, the, the run and the day with gratitude. And then... I do something that I think maybe Henry Nouwen would have done or could have resonated with. I bring to mind a handful of people who have uh, shown unconditional love to me. So uh, that would include my wife and uh, parents and some special people, a mentor, who have been like the face of God to me. And so I I, um, am reminded that I'm loved by God through these people. I lift them up to God in prayer. And when I'm done my run, I come home, uh, I, I sit uh, I light a candle and I engage in uh, something called silent meditative prayer. Uh, some people call it centering prayer. I'm a very easily distracted person, Karen. So <laughs> at any given time, uh, I can feel like there are like a thousand and you know, 32 chimpanzees jumping around in my head. And so <laughs> I'll simply take some time to breathe in deeply through my nose, exhale slowly, breathe in deeply, exhale slowly then I'll start to wonder how much time has gone by. (laughs) And so I use an app uh, called Centering Prayer. It's a free app, and I set a timer to maybe uh, 20 minutes. uh, And as my mind wanders, I'll uh, use scripture like, be still and know that I am God. To just still my mind. I'll continue to breathe deeply. And when I'm done, when the chime uh, sounds, um, letting me know I'm done, I always feel... Uh, just a little bit more relaxed, a bit more focused, a bit more conscious of Jesus' presence. And, you know, if I'm honest, Karen, it's not like I always feel like I'm on top of the world after <laughs> my morning run and meditation, but I always do feel lifted up and a little uh, closer to Jesus, and it really has been a lifeline for me. Well, I I, I appreciated uh, reading it as a guideline. I've read about it. I thought, Karen, you've got to dive in. It's time to do this. I, I, I'm really grateful because it, there's also a simplicity to it. And it is that stillness. It, it's interesting how, how crowded our mind and our days can become and how much we need to live out of that relationship that we've been given with God. That which, which gives us hope in the midst of this pandemic storm that we're in and 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 all the realities of, of a challenging life everybody has things happening to them that can throw you off your game but uh, I appreciated that that idea of of centering prayer you even mentioned the examine I find it so interesting that uh, we Protestants and, and the evangelicals are really finding these incredibly valuable tools that were held by uh, wonderful people that somehow seemed like they were on the other side of the fence to us, but they're not, and they are so rich. Um, do you use the exam, and do you, how do you do with that? Yeah, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, before uh, going to bed, I will um, scan the last uh, 24 hours and, uh, you know, look, look for the gifts, um, you know, whether it was a chance to go for a swim or a run in the morning. Uh, some mornings I... I, I swim. I've got a pool that's been partially open. 
uh, even during the pandemic, uh, I uh, will give thanks if um, I've become aware of a breakthrough in someone's life, um, a, a special connection with a person. So yeah, I definitely do the exam. And here's the thing about the exam. Um, you know, if you engage in a practice like the exam where you look back and you give thanks to God for uh, what felt like gifts coming into the day or the week or the year, um, you you tend to notice more of the the positive things in your life. So I've got a colleague, uh, Edelyn, who I think you've been in touch with. She um, mm-hmm. is a big help to me. Uh, and uh, she was in the market recently for an Austin Mini Cooper, you know, one of those little British cars. Uh-huh. And uh, she started or, uh, noticing Austin Mini Coopers everywhere in Vancouver and around her home. And it wasn't like, <laughs> you know, the dealer was saying, oh, she's on the fence. We're going to flood her neighborhood with more of these little cars. <laughs> Just that she was primed to notice them. And when we uh, take even, you know, three or four minutes in a day to um, thank God for the gifts of the day, whether we speak them or write them down, uh, we'll start to notice more of the, the gifts of our life. And as we associate those good things with God's goodness to us, we'll, we'll feel more of, of his love in our lives. <laughs> That's lovely. And one of the challenges is to really keep a Sabbath. I think that's uh, that that struck me as being a very important word to be giving, cultivating holy rest, you called it. Tell me a little bit about that. You would assume a pastor would know how to do that, but tell me what you've had to learn in your life about Sabbath. Yeah, first of all, you mentioned pastors. I was um, giving a class at uh, Regent College, which is a a theological school on the campus of UBC some years ago, uh, and it was uh, full of uh, either would-be pastors or pastors or pastors' wives. And I, I, I spoke about Sabbath, and a woman in the front row raised her hand and said, my, past, uh, my husband is a pastor, and he hasn't taken a Sabbath in seven months or something. So a lot of pastors <laughs> <laughs> feel like they're, they're uh, uh, too busy to uh, take a Sabbath. But, you know, if you take a Sabbath, as Walter Brueggemann, the great Old Testament scholar, has said, if you if you rest one day in seven and you know, do those things that draw you closer to God and to people and to joy and to life that uh, you will experience the other six days differently. So it's it's a powerful, powerful um, practice. Um, Anne Voskamp, the Canadian writer who I think probably lives not that far from you, relatively speaking, says that, you know, in our busy age, Sabbath is the gift we cannot afford to refuse. Um, It ought not to feel like a have to, but I get to where we, as I said, delight in in God, in um, the most important people in our lives. And during the pandemic, that might be through phone call, it might be through Zoom, we might, might not be able to gather in person, mm-hmm. um, as well as the things that bring us joy. I, I, I love the fact that you emphasize it's a gift, it's not something you earn, mm-hmm. but it is from the very beginning, it's been important to God, from the very beginning. The Sabbath is is really something God invites us to enter into, demonstrated himself and then invites us to enter in. Mm-hmm. Um, what about something that I was struck by in the book is that you've made some choices. You've chosen to live in simplicity, in simple abundance, as you call it. I thought that was very interesting. It's interesting because um, kind of the more we have, the more we have to tend to. And I think... I'd like to hear just a little bit about some of those choices that you're making. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the social science coming out of uh, the research of people like Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize uh, winning economist, uh, clearly shows that, um, you know, we shouldn't glorify poverty. Uh, if you're living in abject poverty, uh, you're not going to experience all, all the all the joy that you could be experiencing. So if you can get yourself out of poverty, that's a good thing. But then after our basic needs are met, and uh, Professor Kahneman uh, measures that as $70,000 of household income if you're living in an affluent city in North America, like San Francisco or Vancouver or Toronto or New York, um, then, uh, you know, if you have additional money, you might be able to drive a slightly nicer, newer car, live in a slightly bigger apartment or home, um, but you're not going to be any happier. Uh, and so we, we know that additional money uh, beyond our basic needs doesn't make us happier. We also know from social science research um, 
done by people who don't necessarily believe in God, that as we give, we experience profound joy. And so one of, you know, I, I've, um, uh, you know, sort of tested this in, in my own life. You know, I, I'm, no, I'm not living heroically. I'm not, I, I don't consider my life to be sacrificial, but uh, as I've been, um, you know, writing books like God and My Everything Can Survival Guide for the Soul, I realized I've got a daytime job. I'm a pastor. Uh, and so uh, in the book contract with HarperCollins, I, uh, I signed off all the royalties so that they're directed to uh, missions that work with the most vulnerable children in the world. And th- thus far, uh, between God and My Everything and uh, survival guide for the soul and related proceeds. We've been able to give between four and five hundred thousand dollars away uh, to support um, some of the most um, vulnerable kids in the world, and, and there's there's joy in that. Um, and, and so, uh, if you're up for an experiment, you know those of us who are joining the conversation, uh, pray about how uh, God might lead you to live a life of uh, joyful generosity, and uh, the two are definitely connected. Oh, I love that. I love it. <laughs> You're speaking a, a language of love that has practical feet on it, which I really appreciate. You know what's kind of fun about the now? People are listening to you, and obviously I'm going to encourage them to get your books. They're wonderful books, Survival Guide for the Soul, and is it called The God? Yeah, God in My Everything. God, God in My Everything, yes. I'm going to encourage people to get the books and find them in the notes from uh, on our podcast. But the other thing that I think was really fun is that we can go and hear you. One of the, the advantages of COVID <laughs> is that there's an awful lot of online opportunities, and we can hear you in action uh, on a Sunday or whenever you're in action at Tenth Church and uh, and have a listen. I, I know you your books have been feeding my spirit, but I. I'm delighted that I can probably go and listen to you in action as well, and I, I look forward to doing that. Um, I was struck by something. Now, I'm taking us back, way back probably, into something that we haven't really talked about, but I was very struck by, and and you as a pastor, I'd love to hear what you think about this. You write, many of us, even those of us who intellectually believe that God is love, have difficulty truly believing that we mm-hmm. are loved. As simple as the words sound, many of us cannot easily accept the fact that I'm accepted. The perceptive priest Henry Nouwen observes that the greatest temptation we face is self-rejection. Do you come across that a lot? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's not just um, among, uh, you know, people that uh, maybe weren't in the in-group in high school or uh, who... Um, were told, you know, by their parents, you'll never amount to anything, or you know, were told as kids you were stupid or ugly or whatever. Um, you know, people that are really successful, um, that uh, you know, have achieved something in business, maybe they're a CEO, uh, they're uh, a prominent leader in the city. I don't want to name names here. Um, you know, uh, folks who've uh, succeeded uh, as um, professional athletes, uh, they can feel this sense of uh, not being enough, of somehow needing to do a little bit more uh, to, to prove themselves. And so um, I think Henry Nouwen is exactly right when he says that the greatest temptation isn't success or popularity or sex or power, but it's, it's self-rejection. And the other things are, are, are real temptations as well, but they're part of that larger temptation of of um, rejecting herself. One of the things that I valued in in reading your book was your honesty. I felt you didn't have it all solved. I felt that the mm-hmm. battle to to uh, not to just want to achieve that might be the very natural drive, and often when you're very capable, that's more than natural. And I think you even drew attention to the fact that you know you can end up feeling it's hard to be humble. It's hard to be humble in it and to find true humility, and yet part of the, as you go through this survival guide for the soul, you talk about some of the things that are needed and humility is needed. And it comes in a sense by some choices. Um, tell me a little bit about what in your life, uh, where that learnings come from. Some of us would say our, our humility learning comes from our failures. But when you have a life with a lot of successes, how do you learn to be humble? Yeah, uh, this is... Um... This, this may sound like a kind of a weird uh, exercise, um, but on my Sabbath day, we talked about Sabbath. Uh, what I've been doing recently is I, I, I take a long walk on the beach with our golden retriever, 
and I do a, you mentioned the uh, practice of exam and care, and I do a lifelong exam, and I start with um, uh, my birth, the, the, the gift of being born, I happened to be in Tokyo, Japan, uh, to parents who wanted me, a grandmother who was there, and I, I go through my life, and I give thanks to God for everything that felt like a gift that, that comes to my mind and heart, even things that I look back on uh, and uh, at the time felt really painful, like a breakup with a girlfriend or a fiancé, as I mentioned, uh, and yet uh, I see how God has fulfilled his purposes for that person and for me. And here's what I found, Karen. I mean, I've worked pretty hard in my life, if I may say so, but all of the the most significant things have been um, stuff I couldn't have controlled. And so, for example, I, I haven't talked about this, but uh, a big turning point in my life, Karen, came when I was a teenager. I was shoplifting. I was trying to be cool and um, loved the adventure of that. And I got caught, and uh, my parents sat me down in my bedroom, had me kneel Asian style, and I, I wasn't very flexible then, so I remember how much it hurt to, to kneel. <laughs> and uh, my dad told me, you brought shame to our family by stealing. And uh, I realized in that moment that I needed to change my life. I didn't know about Christ at that point, but um, not long thereafter, my dad uh, took me first to a prison and said, uh, son, I just wanted you to see your future home, courtesy of my tax dollars. And that didn't scare me straight. <laughs> and uh, my dad, who had uh, been raised as a nominal Buddhist, took me to a Christian youth conference. He had just become a follower of Jesus. And I heard about the gospel. And that opened up a, a new way of life for me as I began to take my first steps following Jesus. So I, I didn't choreograph that. Um, you know, when I... Uh, think about meeting my wife. Uh, I thought I might be single, which is a, a noble calling as well after my fiance uh, Jay and I had broken up and I was um, heading to Japan. Um, there is a fairly new pastor here at 10th uh, to discuss a very personal problem with a friend there on a, a, basically a private island. He had done well in business. He wanted a really secluded spot to discuss this very personal matter. And uh, just before going, uh, an older woman in our church who had been a missionary to India approached me and said, Ken, I'm praying that on this trip you will meet your future wife. Oh. <laughs> I said, oh, don't get your hopes up. I'm going to a private island, you know, <laughs> to meet with a guy friend of mine to talk about a problem that he's facing. And and, and I'm not there to socialize. But while I was there, uh, I don't want to get into all the details, but my friend um, said, I want you to reconnect with uh, one of my friends from college, uh, and, and so he introduced me to someone that I wasn't expecting to meet, actually reconnect with, and uh, one thing led to another, we got married. And so as I look back over my life, uh, I feel that, um, you know, the biggest doors were gifts, that if something hadn't happened and something else hadn't happened, uh, if God hadn't choreographed something, it, it, it wouldn't have gone through. And so I think if people look back over their lives and, and trace... Um, some of the, the causalities, uh, they'll be able to connect the dots to God. And you know, if you've been really successful, you'll be humbled and filled with gratitude and hope. And if you've had a lot of um, failure and, and discouragements, you'll also see God's faithfulness. And so I think that will lift your spirit. That's lovely. A life exam on the beach. Sounds like a good way to, good way to enjoy the freedom that we have and to press in, press in and remember all the ways God has led us. That's really good. Oh, I am so glad to have had a chance to chat with you in person and to recommend this. I, I want to say to others, Survival Guide for the Soul is good food for the soul. And actually, wonderful to know that when you purchase this book, you're actually also benefiting children with great needs. I, I'm so grateful to hear that that's a decision that you made, Ken. That's lovely. Um, thank you so much. Uh, are there any other things that you'd like to share? Anything that you kind of think comes to mind to you, in particular that has come from your reading of Henry Nouwen or, uh, or where you're heading now? A anything that you would like us to hear? One of the things that struck me most about uh, his book, Life of the Beloved, is that I think near the end he talks about how you know the greatest gift that we offer uh, the world is not what we do, but but who we are, the light that we emanate, the love that we offer. And you know, as I was writing Survival Guide for the Soul, my my own father was dying, uh, and uh, I, I began to think about him uh, more. And uh, you know, my dad grew up uh, as a boy 
in a very impoverished Japan that had been decimated by the war. And and he uh, loved to learn, but he couldn't afford books. And so he'd go to a local um, bookstore, and the owner was very kind and said, um, look, I'm going to let you take these books, pay for them when you can. And so he would be up late at night with a flashlight, and he'd be reading. And, and eventually he went on to study at an Ivy League college in the States, which was very rare at the time, and went on, as I mentioned, to become a broadcaster for the BBC and even had a chance to have a little tea with the Queen once, you know, which is a big deal if you're living in England. And Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think about his life, to uh, paraphrase uh, the journalist David Brooks, he had pretty good uh, resume virtues, but he had even better uh, eulogy virtues. Um, as he was uh, dying, you know, what I appreciated about that most was not his accomplishments, but who he was, his uh, immense kindness, his genuine humility, uh, his quiet but very real love for God. And, you know, if you will uh, surrender yourself and, and receive the love and light of God, um, you're going to get enough done. Uh, trust me, your you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're striving at him will be a play. Uh -huh. uh, but you're going to become this beautiful person. You will become the gift, and that will be the greatest contribution that you will offer those you love and, and the larger world. And, and Henry Nouwen has been a great teacher to me in that path. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful for uh, how God has spoken to me through him in his writings. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Really enjoyed it and, and really do encourage people that uh, this is a book that will feed your spirit. So encourage them to get Survival Guide for the Soul. Thank you, Karen. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for all you're doing for the Henry Nowen Society and, and, and the ministry. Uh, yeah, his uh, message is, is timeless and um, yeah, needed, especially now. So thank you for all you're doing to help facilitate that. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, I have so enjoyed listening to Ken Shigematsu today. I hope you got as much out of this chat as I did. And I do highly recommend his book. He's, he is, uh, he's got a couple of books, but I want to say Survival Guide for the Soul, How to Flourish Spiritually in a World that Pressures Us to Achieve, has been good food for my soul, and I'm grateful for it. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we'd be so grateful if you'd take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up, or even share it with your friends and family. For more resources related to today's podcast, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You can find additional content, book suggestions, and other material, including a link for books to get you started in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nouwen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.